This is episode 361 of Jumbo Think. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to Jumbo Think, where we interview dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers all about their journey of turning their dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. Our guest on today's show is Robert Nemec. More about Robert in a moment. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime fan, if you've never subscribed to Jumbo Think, now's the time to do it. Head on over to wherever you listen to podcasts, search for Jumbo Think, and click subscribe. To make it even easier, if you head on over to jumbothink.com, you'll find links to Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, and more. So head on over, subscribe to the show, and never miss another conversation of Jumbo Think. Now let's join today's conversation. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Jumble Think. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host. We have an incredible conversation lined up for you. But before we dive into that, I have an important announcement. Now, for weeks, I have been saying we have some amazing things happening here at Jumble Think. It's true. I have some crazy cool announcements to make. More to come on other announcements. But today, I have the first of those announcements. Recently, I joined the team at podcast magazine as their category director for TV and film podcasts. That means I'm going to be sitting down with more celebrities, more people doing podcasts around the the, the, the theme of TV and film. And I don't want you to miss out on any of those articles. So head on over to podcastmagazine.com and sign up for your free copy of the magazine. You can also get paper copies. It's a really great organization. I've been friends with Steve Ulsher, who runs Podcast Magazine for several years now. My my good friend, Eric Nevins, who's been on the show, and uh, we've done Facebook Lives and a bunch of other things. He is the category director for religion. So joining a lot of friends on the journey of sharing the story of podcasting. And, and here at Jumbo Think, we're all about stories. So I'm so excited to be joining them Matter of fact, the first articles I'm going to be writing and releasing with them coming out this December. So again, make sure to head on over to podcastmagazine.com, sign up for the free copies and get in on the journey of podcasting. All right, so let's dive into today's conversation. We are talking to Robert Nemec. He is the principal, the the founder of this really cool company called Twizthink. You can check them out, Twizthink, T W I S. T-H-I-N-K dot com. One of the things I'm super excited to be talking to them about is this whole idea of design thinking. They have a business approach driven by twisting together of design, technology, and strategy. We're going to be talking about what that means and much, much more. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is the power of experiment. I could tell you more about Robert, but instead, let's go ahead and join the conversation I had with today's guest, Robert Nemec. Bob, thanks so much for joining us here at Jumble Think. Hey, thank you. It's a pleasure, and uh, I look forward to the conversation. I'm I'm excited about this conversation. You run a company called Twizthink, which your wheelhouse is one of our passions. It's innovation. That's what yeah. you guys specialize in. But the journey of creating this was an experiment. Tell us about how Twizthink came together and how an experiment can lead to a highly successful business impacting other businesses on how they approach innovation. Yeah, so the the experiment uh, goes something like this. Uh, Twizthink was launched in 2001. And uh, really the, the premise behind the business was bringing together two uh, very different skills to compete as one team. Yeah. And those skills uh, out of the gate were the, the talent of industrial design. Okay. So traditionally those uh, that maybe get labeled as creative right brain. Okay. And uh, uh, gifted in the domain of uh, uh, visualization and, and, and the arts and uh, even communicating very effectively that way, that skill um, – has proven to be uh, quite powerful. So it was the experiment was uh, bringing that as part of the core team alongside of uh, now this is the other side, the left brain 
a skill of technology minded uh, individuals. And for us, that would be uh, hardcore uh, electrical or electronic engineers. Okay. So left brain, right brain, um, both creative in their own sense, but the experiment, just to play off your word, was uh, bringing them together and uh, competing as one team and then really delivering a service. So we're a consulting firm. We're a professional service that, uh, quite honestly, is uh, is, is working uh, to help organizations innovate, accelerate, and grow. Yeah. You, you mentioned industrial design. I, I want to break that down for a moment. Some people listening might not exactly understand what that means. So when you say industrial design, what does that look like? How, what are the nuts and bolts of that? Yeah, the, the nuts and bolts, that's a great question because that term uh, still perhaps is uh, one that uh, is misunderstood. But um, really, uh, in, in the background before uh, launching Twistthink in 2001 comes from spending nearly two decades in the automotive industry. Okay. And in the automotive industry, that skill of design, really, I would argue every industry, but historically, industrial design has been embedded in the automotive design, uh, the automotive industry, when you think of uh, the aesthetics and the looks and the visual brand language of a variety of car manufacturers and their portfolio of vehicles. Much of that comes from the craftsmanship and uh, the artistic a bent of uh, trained and talented industrial designers. To me, one I have many pet peeves, as all of us do, but one of those pet peeves is this conversation of analytic versus creative. And, and it drives me nuts because so many people say, well, I'm not creative. I, I'm not a writer. I'm not an actor. I'm not a designer. I'm not whatever. I'm an analytic. And yet, as a person who works in the web space and and uh, we bridge the gap between design and development all the time because that's what it takes to create a product for our client there's so much creativity on the analytical side and and i i love that you're marrying that industrial design with the tech minded because when you bring it together you're just taking two aspects of creativity where the analytical side, I think, gets written off as very dry. It, it, there's a lot of beauty in that data and, and the pr- approach that is creativity. Yeah. And to marry those, to see you, you do that. Where was that revolution or revelation where you said, you know, we could just do industrial design. Oh, we could just do tech side. But to say, you know what, there's a better way. When we bring it together, there's a, a happy place that, that really sets the foundation for something magical. Yeah, so for me, uh, that experience and seeing that the the power of those two skills as one came in my corporate experience in the automotive industry for a tier one supplier that in the 80s and 90s invested heavily in growing their business with those two skills embedded within the business. Yeah. And so I had the benefit as a, as, a, as a young person right out of university to see it play out uh, uh, right in front of my eyes and see the impact that once those two skills learned each other's language and process, how they could drive innovation into that particular market, which was uh, the automotive industry. And this organization dominated from an innovation uh, perspective in the 80s and 90s. And and so when you see that play out, and then that company uh, ends up going from a successful global private to becoming a part of a very successful global public company. So I I then got to go through that transition and, and spend a little bit of time in uh, that jet stream too, uh, as the as the makeup then to what was then launched in 2001, and quite simply, we would say the name Twist Think is bringing the skills of design, technology, and strategy, and twisting them together as one. That's 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 our unique selling proposition to the organizations that we serve. And we're simply trying to help them uh, innovate faster and grow faster. And I think 
uh, before the pandemic and even post pandemic. Those are uh, battle cries which uh, many organizations are are uh, continually uh, wrestling in. You know, we live in a society that has taught people to stay in their lane, to do what they're always supposed to do. And yet when you approach it with this right brain, left brain, bringing the cohesion together, that is saying that sometimes staying in your lane isn't the best way to get there. Sometimes you have to cross over from what you're supposed to do and find a new way. How has bringing this together changed your philosophies or your strategies or your approach to innovation itself? Well, it's, it's proven, uh, and it takes time to get there. I mean, we've been at it for 20 years, and it still uh, is uh, is a is a full team effort. <laughs> but um, certainly, uh, when there's respect for the other teammates' process and an appreciation for understanding that process and the language around it, um, that allows uh, a collaboration to uh, to grow at a, at, a, at a different level. And I think what we've proven, what I saw in the automotive industry and now what we've applied as a service firm in a, in a multitude of industries, because we're not just uh, uh, automotive focused. In fact, I would argue that's probably of the 12, that's probably the smallest a domain that we occupy today. Uh, industrial space is heavy for us. Healthcare is uh, really important to us. Consumer appliance. So, so the so the firm and the team have grown uh, certainly in that journey. But uh, one thing that's proven is when those when when that team competes as one and works as one, innovation is a is a natural outcome. And uh, if I could just yeah. you know, maybe uh, throw out there, and it's not innovation as some might misunderstand it, where uh, a group are gathered in a conference room to brainstorm. Okay. Innovation is not an event. It's a process. Okay. And it's a process that needs to be woven culturally into every organization. And so the process to help drive that uh, what we would call innovation excellence is something known today as human-centered design right. or design thinking, and uh, that's a that's a process that acts as the foundation for any organization to kind of uh, build uh, their uh, really secure their future. Operational excellence secures the present. This is a great quote from one of our clients. <laughs> Innovation excellence secures the future. And so smart companies do both, okay. not just one. Yeah. And uh, we're trying to help companies stand on two feet, both operational excellence and innovation excellence. Obviously, uh, this philosophy comes from leadership itself. So you create a culture in which this is the norm. And, and I think of Apple as a good example, maybe, hopefully, uh, where you have Steve Jobs and the difference between Steve Jobs and what Apple was before and Tim Cook and what Apple is today. It seems like they've moved from a innovation centered uh, excellence to an operational excellence. And and both leaders are phenomenal, but it seems like Apple somewhere along the line kind of lost that innovative inventing uh, future forward. And now they're more on this like micro innovation, like, hey, we're going to be great at what we do, but they're not playing big like they did with Steve saying, hey, we're going to come in and create a space you didn't even know you needed. Is that what you're talking about? Operational excellence versus innovation excellence and and is that a good example i i, I mean apple is uh you know I, I think certainly respected on both fronts yeah and uh again the news uh in recent days is they had another stock split and <laughs> um you know that that company even through the pandemic is uh is has profits and growth that are unprecedented so you know high uh, regard for uh, the brand and and the portfolio and how they apply uh and stand on both feet yeah because yeah. that would be a company that i would argue is in that rarefied air of innovation excellence and operational excellence 
So uh, kudos to them. But I think uh, what I've seen over the 20 years with this team is that historically many companies get pulled into um, only focusing on today Mm. and not legitimately uh, investing in tomorrow. Okay. And uh, I've, I've experienced it in the clients that we served and the, and the markets and the leaders that we've uh, connected with. But I would also cite uh, Harvard Business Review in 2015, 2016, did a pretty comprehensive um, survey of both public and private companies and then reported back that Though most organizations and most leaders would say, hey, our team is innovative, yeah. the data that they found was uh, – the truth of the matter is it's only like 9%. Wow. <laughs> that's tiny. So, And that's public and private both. So you okay. say, wow, there's – you know, for us, you could say, well, wow, what a great opportunity for a firm that, that, that touts – innovation, acceleration, and growth as their, uh, as their deliverables. Uh, look at how many we can serve. But I think really what it does is it shines a brighter light on just how hard that space of bull change and risk and fear of failure, <laughs> all these things that I think we can all uh, relate to and uh, how that ends up um, – uh, stunting the growth of innovation excellence. And quite honestly, I think we can all relate to the the fact that it's far easier to take the call today and keep our focus on today. And, hey, let's use uh, another great process called lean manufacturing to yep. pursue operational excellence. Let's just keep our head down. And uh, you can, I mean, smart companies got to do that. Tim Cook is doing that at Apple right now. But you, you got to have a climate and a culture and a leadership that also saying, oh, but while we're doing that, we're also going to secure the future through another great process. And so a lot of what our uh, team and our firm, as we try and deliver our services, we're really trying to help uh, amplify uh, this other process of design thinking or human centered design. And uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, monopolize our conversation, but I just want to give an appeal to anyone listening that if you don't understand, or you've never heard that process, we'll go Google it and begin to learn about it and study it. That's point one. And then point two is, Regardless of whether you're a manufacturer or you're a service company, like a bank or a law firm, or you're even an educator, being connected to the skill of design or industrial design is uh, is 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 critically important. I can't. I'm not a designer by training, but I I've been connected to that skill for the last 37 years. And have seen the power of strategic vis- visualization in a variety of uh, uh, of uh, scenarios and problems uh, needing to be solved. I just I just want to give the appeal to leaders and uh, and organizations to grab onto that skill set. Yeah, yeah, we're going to continue this portion of the conversation in a moment when we come back for segment two. As we wrap up this first segment, though, there's three questions we always ask. The first one is, for you personally, how do you find purpose in what you're doing? Wow. I find purpose in what I'm doing when I see the impact of this uh, team working together as one. So um, I guess maybe the way I'm uh, knitted together, the, the, to me, the joy in this journey has been seeing uh, these different skills come together and work well as one team in serving a client. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of the work that we've done, I'm sure we'll get to at some point in this conversation, um, you know, much of it, most of it is about 
uh, leading clients into bold change and to trying to do something different and to trying to make an impact for the stakeholders that they serve. And, and uh, I think, you know, even speaking on behalf of our team, the work at, at many times is very challenging and hard. But when you uh, when you see the, comp- the team competing together and then delivering results to their client um, in a way that uh, allows our uh, our client to be relevant for another decade or another 20 years, you know, there's there's uh, there's a purpose and and there's and there's joy that comes from that. Our our, our purpose statement is wrapped around uh, transforming how companies create new value so mm-hmm. we're, we're 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 all about change we're all we're kind of change insurgents for those that we serve and even for ourselves what's one challenge you're currently working to overcome one challenge that we're currently working to overcome it's not a new one but boy i tell you it is more important now than it was uh, in january and that is uh, uh, the power of innovation excellence through digital transformation. And gone are the days where, you know, certain service companies or product companies can just dispatch any, anyone to anywhere on the globe. I mean, there's a – I think – Digital transformation as a strategic priority, as somebody recently said to me, has gone from number 12 to number two wow. on their corporate uh, hit list. And I think um, this power of connectivity and creating new user experiences via connectivity to the cloud and, and again, the mega trend of digital transformation and uh, for us – that that is uh, a challenge from a growth perspective that we're trying to appropriately stay focused on and serve. And finally, what's the next big dream, goal, or idea that you have? Well, we we, we have a new offering that we've been uh, developing okay. during the pandemic. Actually, two of them. Yeah. And both of them wrapped around this domain of digital transformation. So my, you know, you could say that the 2020 goal, you know, we got six months left in the year yeah. is uh, we're, we're, we're converting on those as we speak. And this is not uncommon to our 20 year run in mm. 2009 post the, uh, the, the financial crisis of 2008, we launched a separate company called twist HDM. Okay. And that was a product, not a consultative service firm. That was a product that we had developed and built at TwistThink called Limelight. Mm. And Limelight was uh, is a outdoor wireless control system deployed across the country, mostly in uh, cities and municipalities to uh, save energy and manage maintenance for lights in parking lots or parking garages or uh, university campuses or city parks. And so in 2009, we launched that and grew that over a decade until it was in January of 2019 acquired by uh, another great global uh, private by the name of Lutron. Okay. So it's now known in the industry as Limelight by Lutron. And uh, again, it's uh, creating great experiences for lighting control. So uh, a little bit of uh, our DNA is uh, when, when these uh, unplanned for uh, storms occur, you know, how do you, how do you make the most of it yeah. uh, and come out stronger and come out different? And so we did that once, and now we're we're trying to do two of those as we speak. So uh, as we roll into uh, uh, August and through the rest of the year, it's uh, beginning the process now of converting on what we've been uh, incubating on. Love that. Well, we're going to take a break right here. When we come back, we're going to continue the conversation, hear a little bit more of how this actually plays out at 
Twist Think and what uh, Bob and the team over there is doing to help uh, some real, really unique and cool companies and nonprofits do amazing things. We'll be right back. Chasing dreams and ideas is best with others, but where do you find that community, your tribe of dreamers and idea makers just like you? Well, that's a great question here at JumbleThink. We wanted to help. That's why we launched the JumbleThink Facebook group, which is completely free to all of our listeners. All you have to do is head on over to jumblethink.com slash group, take you right to the Facebook group, join the group, join the conversation, start chasing those dreams and ideas with other dreamers and idea makers just like you. Remember, chasing dreams and ideas is always better with others. So join the Facebook group today. That's jumblethink.com slash group. Now let's continue the conversation. We are back with Bob Nemec. Before we dive into the conversation, how can people find and connect with you and your team? Oh, I think they can go to uh, twistthink.com, even in light of this podcast, Stroke Jumble, and uh, you'll, you'll land right where you need to land. Uh, the firm name Twistthink has uh, got one T in the middle, so it's T-W-I-S-T-H-I-N-K. And uh, you'll find uh, all you need to know about the team and uh, the work that uh, the team is uh, doing today. Love that. We'll put those links in the episode notes. So wherever you're listening right now, just click on them. It'll take you right there. Right. You know, in the first segment, we talked about this right brain, left brain, innovative thinking and innovation, excellence and design thinking. I, I want to go and actually peel back and see how this plays out in the, the real world. And I know that you've worked with some really cool companies, Charity Water, which is a nonprofit. We love them. Uh, you've worked with Herman Miller. You've worked with Stryker Medical. You've worked in various different industries, so multiple verticals when it comes to how business plays out. Can you give us some examples of how this process process actually works out in a real-world environment? Well, we have a client in the mining industry that several years ago, probably three years ago, came to us with, uh, I think, the leadership intrigue and interest in wanting to understand how digital transformation could perhaps allow them to pivot. Mm. And so interesting question, interesting to get kind of what, what, what we saw was uh, an aligned leadership team saying, hey, this is something we'd be wise to explore. And in a sense, to their credit, uh, they didn't just delegate it to the masses. They, as leaders, were engaged with their team to try and uh, get their head around, hey, could this impact our firm for good? Mm. And so uh, for us, in uh, deploying and leveraging the process of human-centered design, you know, there's, there's uh, four key steps to uh, human-centered design. It starts with discovery analyze, create, and develop. Okay. So we led them on that journey of human-centered design, following those four steps, using the right tools and methods along the way in order to clearly paint a clear picture of their customers' heads and hearts. Mm -hmm. So what are the pain points that their customers are seeing today? Who are their customers today and what will those uh, clients look like in the future? Who are some of the secondary or tertiary stakeholders like dealers or even internal teammates to their organizations that should be uh, understood and, uh, again, pain points and uh, opportunities identified with all of the stakeholders, right? That's what the power of human-centered design does is it gets you into the heads and the hearts of the stakeholders, which for many organizations, you mentioned Apple earlier, if they've been at it for a while, what we've seen is the trend is you slowly begin to allow Excel spreadsheets and ROIs to drive 
your your business process and you take your eye off of the client or the customer. Yeah. Yeah. We recently had uh, Ed Freeman on who really defined that word uh, shareholder philosophy uh, or, or not shareholder, stakeholder philosophy versus yeah. shareholder philosophy. And, and I think that that's one of the pivots going on with businesses right now saying, you know what? Uh, our business is more than just about the shareholder or the the shareholders. It's about the stakeholders, which are our clients, our team, our our leadership, our our, our obviously shareholders too. But uh, is design thinking and human centered design like this? Do you think that by changing that that outcome from being just simply how can we get biggest return on investment for our sh- for our shareholders to stakeholders, which say there's a benefit across this is one of the driving forces behind this. Yeah, totally. So on this journey with uh, this mining company, we led them through those four phases in, in a, in a period of months. But at the end of it, what it did is it, it painted a clear target of what their first step and their first strategy for digital transformation, what that should look like and what the product could actually uh, become. Mm -hmm. So it allowed them to uh, visualize, here's how technology may be added to our portfolio product and here's the outcome that is expected when, when the technology gets deployed. Yeah. And so, in a sense, HED allows um, for the the target to be painted clearly before you then spend um, uh, a longer window of time and a larger sum of capital yeah. to bring it to life. Yeah. And I think many times this is even before digital transformation was uh, what it is uh, today. Uh, organizations would in a sense, guess at, Hey, I think our customers will like this. Yeah. So let's go develop this. And, and, and in a sense, that's why you see, uh, you know, failure in companies, uh, really remaining relevant in, uh, creating new products and new services. So, um, you know, the, the point in that example is HCD as the process paints the target, and then uh, you can unleash the capital to at the right time to then convert on what the what what the opportunity really looks like. No guesswork. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, those four steps are discover, analyze, create, develop. Correct. Yeah, analyze, create, and develop. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I look at what you do from the standpoint of somebody might have an idea, they might have a problem, and internally they don't have the wherewithal to walk through this. How much of what you do is about helping them develop a product, and how much of what you do is really being their guide on a process? Yeah, so I think it starts out, and this is really our our unique uh, capability and 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 uh, offering as a firm so we can help a client map out the strategy and we do that um as we've as we cited you yeah. know via a process yeah we're not winging it we're not brainstorming <laughs> there's a process and we're going to map out the strategy and then uh once the strategy once the target is painted we have the team that can then convert on it mm-hmm the team that can actually develop the algorithms that are going to live on an edge device in the back uh, woods of uh, <laughs> Australia and reliably collect data and push the data to the cloud and create a new user experience for those key stakeholders. Yeah, that, It's that ability to, uh, to, to start with the strategy, but then... Uh, convert on it once it's brought to life and then uh, uh, hold ourselves accountable to the results that follow once the heavy lifting has been accomplished. It's that that end-to-end spectrum that we're trying to uh, bring uh, to the clients that we serve. 
So let's say there's a company out there and they kind of are feeling stagnant. They're feeling kind of locked into what they're they've always done. And they're, you know, there, there are different stakeholders in that process. There might be an executive team, a board. It's hard to get everyone on the same page to go, hey, we're going to go on a new journey. We're going to go through this human centered design. What are some things that they can do to condition their team to say, you know what, just staying the status quo and how, how we've been isn't good enough for tomorrow or the, the next yeah. year? How do, how do you make that pivot as a company? Because that seems like the first hurdle that all of these companies are having to do, whether it's this mining company, whether it's the other organizations uh-huh. you've worked with, unless their team is on board, it's just going to just going to burn. The, the process isn't yeah. going to work. Yeah, it, it, you're right. So you, you got to have leadership. Uh, engagement. You can't create a uh, simply a functional team and kind of delegate it to them to go go do that, go innovate, and let me know how it goes next month. Yeah. So you got to have leadership buy-in, leadership alignment, which in most cases is where it starts or where it dies. Right? Oh, wow. yeah. keeping, keeping the C-suite aligned uh, is really where it begins. And then um, you, you, you've got to begin a process. I would argue, and we have, uh, you know, we, we would use language like uh, an offering we have called the greenhouse method. Okay. It's all about allowing organizations to build uh, innovation excellence and momentum Mm. behind that using the process of HCD, but not putting it at risk within the current corporate climate of that organization. Because what uh, many studies would indicate is uh, it's sometimes, most times it's difficult to get something new to begin to grow within a strong organization that has always been in this market with this thing for several uh, years or decades, right? So, yeah. hey, let's, let's establish it in an off-site greenhouse first and begin the process of allowing that plant to just carry out the analogy, allowing that plant to root out a little bit and grow a little bit before you subject it to uh, the harsher environment of the core uh, domain of that organization, and and really the you know we we refer to ambition arcs. You know, yeah. companies are are smart to stay focused on operational excellence and innovation excellence within their core. Yeah. You got to do that, and you got to innovate there too. But along with that, what about adjacencies? What about other markets? that maybe uh, your core could be deployed into those adjacencies. And then, hey, what's what about transformative? What about bold change and something that's you, – you got to have a roadmap that just like a stock portfolio is appropriately pa- balanced. So you have 70% maybe on your core and 20% uh, investigating opportunity in the adjacency spaces and then 10% – Maybe is uh, a, a little bit more of uh, uh, of outside of the ordinary. It, it almost seems like in that operational excellence, which is so significant to this journey, you get hyper focused and you can't see what is possible or could be. And yeah, close, you get too close to it, Michael. Yeah, and so in that journey of being too close to it. Uh, you know, one of the stats here is that through Twizthink, you've helped develop over 200 patents in the last decade, which that alone is just an amazing number. Uh, and and so what you're doing isn't just saying, let's let's just kind of figure out how we can pivot your business. Let's figure out you're, you're saying, how do we actually create new space? How do we see the potential that isn't there? How do we innovate beyond just uh, – maybe pivoting. And I think sometimes yeah. we, we think a pivot is an innovation, but really it's just a, a structural change of direction. And, yeah, yeah, and I, yeah. I think that that's the problem. You guys are helping to create 
spaces that didn't exist. And I think yeah. that that's hard for a lot of CEOs to say, I, I don't know how to find the opportunities that don't exist today. And yeah. they might be saying, well, here's something that's adjacent, but I don't really – what are the biggest things that you think in that process of opening the, the minds to what could be that, that really hold back creating what could be to what is? Yeah, that, I mean, I mean what, uh, some of what you're speaking to is the misunderstanding around innovation and the power of uh, a diverse team that truly is creative and has imagination <laughs> woven or wrapped around them, right? Yeah. And creative and imagination, those are skills. And, you know, you said something earlier that I think is uh, worth emphasizing. Those are skills that we all have. Yeah. But, um, you know, if you don't exercise those skills and, you know, some might say, you know, for me, a lot older, you know, the – the education journey that I went on ages ago, you know, wasn't one that really helped foster those skills of creativity and imagination. But we all have them. And so um, we got to embrace that and almost look at it uh, uh, as uh, maybe something that uh, can be found even in this season of a company's life or uh, an individual's life within that company. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. But you gotta, you gotta begin a, a process of exercising it. And certainly, um, these, uh, disparate skills of great design with great technology is one way to unlock it. And we monitor and manage and track the intellectual property that we produce because it, goes back to the experiment of what happens when you bring great design and great technology as one team. That's a proof point that we hold ourselves accountable to. It delivers uh, on uh, results in terms of creating something new. In this world of COVID, I think that a lot of businesses are struggling to figure out how to move forward. And some will go away. They won't exist, uh, unfortunately, or in some cases, that's probably for the better. I love that earlier on the conversation, you say, you know, whether it was the recession, whether it's now, you look at this as a transformable, transformable season of opening up new opportunities. So if you're talking to a business owner right now who's struggling to say, I've always, this is the space we've played in. That space has dramatically changed because maybe they're a restaurant or maybe they're, they're a people-centric service that can't happen because it's face-to-face. -face. What could they be doing to rethink this time and use it as a launching pad into the new future that they could be creating? Well, uh, I mean, uh, that, that's, that's the opportunity that we all have. And uh, again, I, I would just say uh, the fact that they might be wrestling with that issue is a, a great sign. Mm. Trying to answer what's next or wrestling with, okay, now what do I do? We can't all go out and make uh, hand cleaner from our <laughs> distillery. Right. Though th that's worked out to be a positive part of this journey. But um, there are still calls for uh, innovation uh, to any organization. And, and, and so it's about taking small steps and building momentum in pursuit of securing the future through innovation excellence. Yeah. And so the process of HCD uh, applies the constraints to allow that to be done and to be done consistently. And most often, uh, organizations struggle, leaders struggle because they view it as an event. Mm. And you know what? This ain't, this isn't the last pandemic that we're going to face. There's going to be some other challenge yeah. that we face in the future. So, you know, the, 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 the reality is organizations have to stand on two solid feet and uh, have to lean into this for the long haul. It won't come in a day. It won't come in a week and it won't come in a month. But if you remain persistent in leaning into it, it's going to come and it's going to transform organizations so that they can they can withstand anything. 
Yeah. It's so even powerful. a pandemic that for the first time in our history, you know, basically shut down uh, every uh, manufacturing operation in the country. I yeah. mean, who would have ever thought? Yeah. And uh, uh, the companies that are going to be relevant for the next pandemic are the ones that are innovating now. Yeah. The ones that try and hope that it's going to return back to normal are are going to be gone. Yeah. Yeah. So, so good. Well, we're going to take a break right here. And when we come back, it's rapid fire questions. We'll be right back. Later in the week, we have a really cool conversation lined up for you. It's actually a really important conversation, too. I think with COVID and all of the insecurities in the unknown of the future, a lot of people are struggling to find purpose. They're struggling to figure out what they're created to do. That is our heartbeat at Jumble Think. And later in this week, we're sitting down with a new friend of ours. His name is Mark Delaney to go deeper into that conversation about finding your purpose and how you can... Do it in a way that can launch you into a new future. If one thing about COVID that is good, it is causing people to rethink the future. So I hope you will join us for that conversation later this week with Mark Delaney. Now let's jump into rapid fire questions. Levez seulement le bras pour mettre l'aiguille sur le disque. Mettez le contact. We are back with Bob Nemec. All right. We're going to dive into rapid fire questions. Are you ready for them? Sure. Okay. Go. As a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, an engineer, just like my dad. Nice. What is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? Find a talented designer to collaborate with and visualize it. That'd be one. Don't get so caught up on... Uh, going online and doing some business plan, you know, uh, framework that you, you know, anyone can find online. Uh, that, that'd be one. And then two would be uh, to talk, talk, talk. Mm-hmm. Go out and get feedback from the targeted market that you're uh, trying to, uh, in a sense, deliver a new innovation to. So engage with the stakeholders as quickly as you can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it drives me nuts uh, in the world of startups that people are so guarded about their idea and afraid that someone will steal it, that they're not willing to have conversations that could inform the decisions they're making. And I think that kills so many startups because they're just – they're guarded on something that – if they're not having conversations, then how are they going to actually build something that has significance? Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and maybe maybe another point, a third point would be go with minimum viable product. Don't yeah. over overthink it and overdevelop it. Just go for uh, uh, based off of engaging with stakeholders, you know, start with a solid base hit first. Yeah. I think many times uh, entrepreneurs uh, overthink it and overbuild it and mm. then miss the opportunity and then miss the market, too. Yeah. What's one change you'd like to see in the world? That's a hard question. Uh, <laughs> certainly, uh, well, one is, uh, you know, for four years, we've been heavily invested in helping a nonprofit called Charity Water bring clean drinking water to the 1.3 billion that don't have access to it on planet Earth today. Yeah. We're, and we're using digital transformation to bring uh, their unique offering to life. Yeah. And so as you get into the world that they're in day in and day out and, uh, your awareness is, is, uh, your, your eyes are opened up to, uh, how many don't have access yeah. to clean water and then the impact on life because of that, uh, it's hard not to, uh, in a sense, be motivated and kind of inspired that, wow, that's a problem worth solving. So uh, yeah. you know, I think I can speak on behalf of the 50 behind me that 
Uh, yeah, that's a problem that if, you know, if our efforts could uh, take the 1.3 down uh, a, a few clicks, uh, that's a problem worthy of our team's effort. What do you want your legacy to be? I, I, I don't, I, I, I want uh, the legacy of Twistthink to be that we were a firm that really achieved all that we're uh, capable of achieving mm. and that we made an impact such that uh, both uh, in our community as well as globally, uh, we made an impact that uh, 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 brings uh, encouragement and hope. Where do you find inspiration? Uh, in the scripture, I find insp- inspiration. <laughs> um, I find uh uh, inspiration in my wife and five children and nine grandchildren. And when uh, I have the, the benefit and privilege to see the, the eyes of the team that I work with, uh, boy, that, that gives me uh, – my tank is full. <laughs> I'm inspired. So I'll run uh, really hard for that body in any capacity. Yeah. I just have to say this, you know, I'm able to look at you. You're looking at me. You don't look like you're old enough to have grandkids. I'm just going to say it. I'm going to put it there. That amazes me alone. And five kids, we have two and, and that's a challenge in itself. So five kids. Wow. Yeah. It's all, it's, you know, like the 20 years that twist think, right. It just (laughs) uh, goes by in a snap and, uh, and, uh, Again, I, I think I can speak for uh, certainly my wife, but you know, even the team. We are just so uh, uh, fortunate with uh, the journey we've had over the last 20 years. Our, quite honestly, our goal in the next five years is to double again. Wow. Our goal in the next five years is to connect 100 million uh, devices and, uh, you know, we're, we're excited by uh, what we see uh, in the future. And now, like a lot of your listeners, we know we got a lot of hard work to do, a lot of learning to do. But again, when you're uh, connected with a team that you believe in, all of that other stuff uh, is really uh, pretty easy. And uh, so uh, here we go. Yeah. What is one book you think every dreamer should read? One book every dreamer should read? I would just point to one book that every leader should read Mm. if they're really trying to sharpen their sword and their understanding in this domain of human-centered design. And uh, the book uh, is probably maybe a decade old, but it's uh, The Design of Business. Yeah. And it's written by a guy out of uh, Toronto by the name of uh, Roger Martin. And uh, if anyone uh, during this uh, interview or this collaborative session that we've had together, Michael, (laughs) uh, is wanting to maybe uh, explore that a bit further, I would say that's a great uh, that's a great book that hopefully will raise awareness and maybe even raise uh, understanding of how uh, how uh, the skills of left and right brain thinking can be brought into any organization. What is one trend you're currently excited about? Uh, Connectivity and digital. And then we'll wrap it here with our final rapid fire question, which is what is one dream that you still want to fulfill in your life? I want to compete in one Ironman triathlon. Nice. Any specific one? Oh, well, you you have to qualify to do the one in Hawaii. So I guess that would actually mean I'd have to do two, but... (laughs) If I could, if I could figure out a way to get there and do that, uh, boy, that, 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 yeah, that's on my radar. As we wrap up, I always like to leave our guests have a final thought to all of us listening right now. What would you like to leave us with? Your organization can only grow if you stand on two feet, Mm. operational excellence and innovation excellence. Love that. Thanks so much for taking time out, sharing your story, giving us some insights into, you know, what this this world of human centered design can really look like. And and just uh, I know for a lot of people, this might be the spark to actually explore what this looks like for them as an individual. But even further, for a lot of entrepreneurs right now, this is going to open up 
new possibilities that they could never imagine. I hope so. Yep. Thank you so much, Michael. It's good to meet you. I hope uh, one day uh, we can meet and uh, shake hands. Once again, I want to thank Bob Nemec for taking time out and joining us on Jumble Think. Go check out what he's doing. The links are in the episode notes. And now for my final thought for you today. We talked a lot about innovation and design. The truth of the matter is that if we are entrepreneurs, if we're idea makers, if we are dreamers, if we're not designing the future, it's not just going to happen. So take some time today to step back, to think, to process, to begin the journey of thinking about how your dreams will impact the world around you, how it will impact people, your family, those customers. Begin the process of designing the business you want, not just building a business, but really designing it and thinking through the process of design. I hope you'll do that today. I hope you'll take some time and really think about what your dreams are and how you get there. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode of Jumble Think. It means the world to me that you would listen. And I hope today's episode challenged you and encouraged you on the journey of chasing dreams and ideas. Now it's your turn to get out there, to dream big, and to change the world around you. arrière, sur les côtés, vous êtes une autre personne, les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant, dans quelques mois, lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.